We are recording. Well, welcome everybody. We have Tracy Whitlock here from the Office of Special Services and Inclusive Education to talk to us about certification. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you. It's nice to be here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and have a quick little presentation just to go over it with you. Let's make sure I open the right one. Sorry, I'm so used to having two screens. It's always hard to work on just one screen. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. I'm just gonna get started from the beginning. So hello, my name is Tracy Whitlock. I coordinate special projects for inclusion out of the Aussie office. Um, and under that role, I lead our PBIS work, our math for Maine work, um, our inclusion work, and educator supports and transition. So if there's anything in any of those areas that you're ever interested in, I am the person to reach out to. But today I'm talking to you in terms of our certification supports um, and how I can help you all with your transition of FAPE. So the certification that we're going to talk about is children, uh, um, teacher of children with disabilities, birth to school age, the 282B. And conditional certification, the process for conditional certification is that anyone who wants to be conditionally certified with a 282, 282B, or K-8 or 712, it's all the same, you need to have at least a, a bachelor's degree and nine semester hours in special education coursework. And then in that first year of en enrollment, you need to be enrolled in an approved program, which is um, there's conditional certification supports through the SEEDS project, which is special educator engagement, development, and supports um, out of our office and in collaboration with the University of Maine. And so that's what you need for a conditional. Now, if you have people who already have their 282, and they are need the 282B, they'll already have the degree and they'll have obviously the nine semester hours of special education coursework. So they will be eligible to get that 282B conditional as soon as they apply. If you have people who are EdTech threes who wanna do the EdTech three pathway for certification for the 282B, they also will need to have a, a bachelor's degree then they have to have three years of positive evaluations, signed evaluations, and they have to um, be employed as a special education teacher and be enrolled in a post-baccalaureate or master's approved program for special education. And then they have to maintain their GPA. They also need to be part of the SEEDS project, those conditional certification supports. This year for conditional certification supports, we have um, communities of practice that we're leading and we have four cohort mentors. Um, there's one for um, pre-K, there's one for elementary, middle school, and high school. And those just started last week. So if you have anyone who is doing the conditional 282B and they're interested in those, they can join us. Um, as someone, if they already have a 282, they're not required to be a part of those communities of practice. Um, the way we provide those supports is based on individual needs. And someone who's had a 282 for you know, years and years of teaching experience, the only thing they need to get from us for the conditional is to reach out to Valerie Smith, and that's valerie.smith at maine.edu, and she'll give them the letter saying that, she, that they're enrolled in SEEDS, and what that entails is if you're enrolled, it means that we know about you and can provide supports, and again, those supports are made based on what the individual needs are, so if we have someone who is going through the EdTech 3 pathway, they're gonna get a little bit more support obviously than someone who might've gone through a traditional pathway um, and is a newer teacher. And definitely um, we don't need to provide the level of support for somebody who's a 282 and been a 282 teaching for years and years. Um, they just need to have that letter because it's part of the certification process. So one of the things that people are noticing is that chapter 115 has changed over the years. And um, 
Aaron, I see people are putting things in the chat, so we'll get to that at the end, if that's okay. Um, I told them we're going to address it. <laughs> for people who have a 282 currently, they may have gotten that 282 two different ways, either pathway one, which was an accepted um, and approved special educator preparation program, or pathway two, which is a transcript analysis. Chapter 115 changed about, I think it was about two or three years ago now, and there are additional requirements that weren't necessary in, um, years ago. So what people are seeing when they're getting their letters for their 282B when they get their, their transcript analysis, they're noticing that there's some additional courses that is gonna be required because of the change in chapter 115 by the state board. Those look like um, three semester, it used to be you had to have 24 hours in special education coursework. Now that's been broken down a little bit more specifically. So three hours each in evaluation, um, specially designed instruction, reading, and then at least one course in UDL, inclusion, types of disabilities, program planning, planning, behavior, or special ed law. Another addition is there needs to be a three semester hour course in um, diversity centered contact related content related to today's classrooms and a human development, ed psych, child development type of course. And then for the 282B, there's that three semester hours in teaching um, early childhood special education. And I'll give these slides to Aaron um, when we're done and to Sandy so that they can share them with you. So there are some supports that we're gonna offer for your educators who need that 282B certification for this cohort one. Um, the first thing is there'll be a reimbursement for certification costs to get a conditional license issued. It's $100. Then when they have their professional license issued for the 282B, it'll be another $100. I'm working with them. I've met with um, the list of people that I already have, and I'm sure there's more out there and I can meet with them too. Um, setting up vendor codes so that they can be reimbursed unless the SAU decides that they're going to pay the conditional and then we would reimburse the SAU. It just depends on how you want to do that. Um, and then we're meeting to look at um, certifications been really helpful. They've pulled everything that each of those people need so that we can customize those supports to make sure that they have the coursework that they need because you have three years after you get your conditional to complete all the coursework that's required. Um, the department will also um, reimburse either the SAU or the school or the um, the student anything that's above whatever is contractually allowed um, in the SAU. So some SAUs offer their teachers um, two courses a year. Um, anything above that, the department would um, provide supports to make sure that those people get everything that they need for the 282B. So next steps. Um, have people reach out to me. There's my contact information. Um, I will be customizing support um, for each of them to make sure that they get what they need to get in that conditional, um, especially if they have a 282 already. That's really easy. They just need to apply and they'll get their 282B conditional. If you have people who are um, don't have their 282 or um, are an EdTech 3, you'll, you'll have to follow those other pathways um, that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and again, Educators with a 282 should just go ahead and apply for that 282B conditional as soon as possible because they're already um, eligible for it because they have the bachelor's degree and the nine semester hours in special education coursework. Here, so yes. I'll take you off. Yes, I will mute myself. No, no. I, I just wanted to add, um, we know there's a lot of concern about very, very veteran teachers, 282s, and this barrier. As, you know, we've been talking about this barrier and we're working on um, supporting how we can understand this better. Um, so the only thing right now, we are working on a pathway to a 282B certification, which is um, you know, again, now we have this conundrum of there's additional coursework needed to be able to get a new certification and a 282B is essentially a new certification. But if you, um, you know, I, I know that I've been working with some individual cases of people who are just extraordinarily veteran teachers. They have a lot of experience working in elementary schools. They're literacy instructors. They have a lot of experience. So I know that this is going to be a shock when they get this letter with 28 things that they have to do. I'm exaggerating. 
but not much. I'm not exactly much. Not. So that's shocking for people. And we know that. And we want to tell you that we are working to support a greater understanding of the constituents that really think that this certification requires um, a different type of special education instruction. So please do, if you have a, um, a veteran 282 that is, um, you know, in this process of getting 282 conditionally certified, have them, um, have them apply. They don't, no one gets denied certification, I'm told. That's not, but they, uh, they'll get a letter that says, this is what we need to do. If you have a professional 282, you will be eligible for a 282B. And then there's a lot of pathways right now, if you have interested ed tech threes, for us to provide some education at no cost to the individual to become. So it's a great time to be an ed tech in wanting to um, obtain professional credentialing because we did add that into chapter 115. So um, we know that these letters are gonna be shocking. We ask you to um, do it anyway, get your 282B certification, reach out to Tracy Whitlock for, um, for reimbursement. If possible, if your SAU can reimburse that employee, we can reimburse you. You can put that on your invoice. Um, you can invoice us for that. So um, that's up to you. We'll also pay for the professional certification when it comes forward. Um, and like I said, we are working internally to really look at how people are working professionally so that we can um, kind of look at their criteria to see how they meet these conditions. And we're also looking at um, some coursework that embeds some um, literacy DEI and some overlapping of some of the requirements. So I can't really say that we have a clear path forward for that yet, but just do understand that we understand how for some teachers who are applying for this, this is pretty, you know, pretty shocking to get this letter. So we understand that. Please just let them know. All they need to do now is have that 282B certification. They do have to email Valerie Smith and get signed up with SEEDS. And they will have additional um, opportunities for professional development through that, but they know, and they know they do not need a mentor. <laughs> uh, as a professionally certified person, you don't need a mentor through SEEDS. Uh, so we do know that, but because we're trying to follow the guidelines of chapter 115, we do have to sign them up for SEEDS, just register them. So any questions about anything I just said? There are a couple of questions in the chat, um, but it looks like you've been able to cover those so far. Thank you. There's a question about from Darcy about when they, I think she just put it back in there again. Um, when do they need the 282 B to be working in pre-K? If you're providing special education, in preschool, you need a 282B to support that instruction. Um, that is when they need it. If they're a special education teacher, um, there are general education certifications that span the pre-K to third grade. There's also um, emerge, there's also an 081 that is a early childhood. Um, at some point, I feel like I've reviewed with you the different certifications, but if I haven't, I have a nice infographic to kind of show you who's on first with all of those. Um, and the problem is there's, you know, there's certifications in special education that span pre-K to 12. Those three certifications are a 286. They're a 292, deaf and hard of hearing, and a 291, teacher of the visually impaired. Those three special education certifications span pre-K to 12. If you have anyone who has a 286, this is a great time to um, get them involved in this preschool work. Um, and like I said, we we understand that there is a barrier in the way the 282s are arranged um, for this transition. And so again, you are the first cohort that's going in through and um, we are, um, you know, I, I, again, some of you have um, 
shared the letters that you've been receiving from our certification office, please know that our certification office is only following chapter 115. And it's up to this larger team of DOE employees to kind of um, understand how we're gonna use, we have a million dollars to provide uh, as part of this as the pathways to get more people certified in 282B. So whatever we um, can come up with for folks to participate in, it will be free for them. And to, to sort of build on what Aaron is saying, Beth, I see what you're writing here. Um, you know, certainly the transcript review is a process that um, that's the piece that Aaron is speaking to is that um, when we're able to see, you know, what uh, the course uh, explanation or um, course description or syllabus included, then a lot of times we're able to go a little bit deeper. When it comes to um, the requirement around um, diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion, and and um, culturally competent uh, instructional content uh, for this age group, that is, again, going back to what is required in Chapter 115 as part of the state board rule. So, you know, having some of the flexibilities built in around uh, different um, uh, competencies, demonstrations of competencies are allowable, depending on whether or not that's articulated in a pathway. Um, and that's something that the state board determines. It is something that the Department of Education then must implement. Megan, can you tell me, Chapter 115 was just open for public comment. Is it still open? I believe it is. I'm going to go to the rulemaking page and I'll drop it in. So any interested member of this group should write for public comment to Maybe Chapter what? 115. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to mute someone. Um, so yeah, you have the opportunity to give this feedback to um, the state board as chapter 115 is open for comment right now. It might be a very powerful thing for you to um, be supporting expansion of pre-K programming in your, in your SAU and what that experience has been like for chapter 115. I know, um, I know Beth, the person, because I've worked with that person, is just like everybody should have a special education teacher with that much knowledge. <laughs> uh, she's just, you know, I mean, her resume is outstanding. So it's, it is a shock, I think, to, you know, say, oh, you're not, you're not adequately trained for this. Um, so, it, and that's not what it means, obviously, but it, it feels that way. So um, just know that this is a great time for you to give your public comment as cohort one to identify some of the, the challenges that have been, um, you know, making this expansion activity difficult. And Beth, to address the question about it should have been one of our first considerations. It was, that's part of the reason why we had the funding um, in place, but rulemaking uh, outside of what is a main department of education rule is a bit beyond our, um, our control. And um, even back two years ago, when this new rule was being proposed, um, the department had a lot to say about it at the time. And um, ultimately, the legislature and the state board moved forward with what we have now. And um, in part because of people's advocacy, including folks on this call, um, one of the reasons that the legislature went back to the state board in the last legislative session was to say exactly that, that, gee, what we did two years ago, even though that whole process took more than two years to do through um, consensus rulemaking, which is a, a very involved process, um, isn't going as well as, as I think anybody hoped it would. Um, but it is a process that is taking some time. But the reason that we were so excited about the Pathways Project and the SEEDS Project is that we are doing a lot of this work on the front end to say, how can we work with our certification team to still implement the rule as we must? Um, and at the same time, how can we advocate uh, through the rulemaking process that I'm about to drop into the chat um, with uh, with regard to what the real world implications are for how this, this uh, rule is being implemented? Um, I'm putting in the chat right now the proposed rule changes, um, including you'll see right now there are opportunities for public feedback. There is... Um, what are called uh, conceptual conversations being held all over the state. Um, and for each of those opportunities, there are um, Zoom opportunities also. Um, what we have found is in 
in any case where we are talking about rulemaking in particular, um, having multiple voices um, is really powerful and being able to tell the stories and the sort of provide the cases that you're sharing um, help to really provide some real world examples of the impact from, from what people may have intended to what people are experiencing. Tracy, Without any, or, okay. Oh, you have no, I was just going to say if there's no other further questions, we can um, shift to the next session. I mean, the next agenda. Yes. So, next on our agenda, uh, Jen is going to review the survey results about meetings. We wanted to gather your input and to provide you the right amount of support for our cohort one meetings. And so thank you to everybody who filled those survey questions out. And Jen, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Sandy. So the majority of the folks had decided that they like to go to biweekly meetings. And Sandy and I kind of looked at the calendar to see how we can make sure we don't um, end up going two weeks without a meeting. So because of Thanksgiving coming up, believe it or not, that's right around the corner. So we're going to skip next week and our next meeting will be November 6th. And then we'll go every other week from that point. And I will delete the, I'll, I'll adjust this link that we have to represent that. And Sandy, do you want me to go into the breakout rooms that how yes. we're gonna do that? So for part of this meeting, we're going to break into breakout rooms where we will have facilitators there to do some Q&A. So the breakout rooms, you'll join the room that best fits your need. So we have a room for finance and data, for the superintendents and for the special ed directors. And then for those who are in programming can just stay right on this link, just stay right where you are. And um, Nicole, Jackie Hersom, and Lori Whittemore will talk with all of you. So I'm going to open up the rooms. So go ahead and join the appropriate room. And I think I did it right. I've never done this before. So can all of you see which room to join? You have to scroll down to the bottom of all the names, and that's for real. Oh, gotcha. I see where everybody's joining now. Thank you. Do you want us to join a, a group in particular? Any, um, well, any CDS staff can go to any room that they would like to go to. Susie, maybe you would be best to stay right here on the programming piece of it. Okay, I'm sorry. Where do we find the rooms? Uh, if you scroll, I can't, I don't know if I'm seeing what, I don't see what you're seeing. So, um, Nicole, would you be able to help me? Screen. Join yeah, breakout rooms. Of, at the bottom of your screen, Marianne, where there's like the, or maybe at the top that your Zoom sort of dashboard, so to speak, there should be a block that says join breakout room. Or if you know which one you want to go to, then um, Jen should be able to manually move you. Okay. Let me see, hold on. Um... Oh, I, there we go. More. I didn't go to my moors. Okay. Thank you. More, more. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> That's another option. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, we don't necessarily have a specific topic to share or discuss. We're uh, looking to just approach this time together. I believe Jen 
is Jen still been here? Nope. Um, I was going to say Jen, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, merely to address what's coming up for folks in regards to your programming thus far, what questions you might have, what challenges, successes we'd love to hear, what's working well, um, any surprises or things that we can be thought partners on. Um, if we have answers to questions, we're happy to provide those, but if there's um, questions that we don't have answers to yet, then we'll jot them down and, and um, refer back to the main group for, uh, you know, responses to those. So, and I'm not sure what districts y'all are from, so I can't ask specific questions. <laughs> but um, I know our early learning team has been working to support districts in expanding public pre-K into next year. So I, I might just pose the question, are folks feeling like your programming that you have now are adequately meeting the needs of your four-year-olds and any students that you have with um, IEPs? Or are you feeling like expansion in the future may be necessary? Is that something that we can help you sort of think through? Just throwing it out there as an option. I'm going to jump in, um, Marianne and Callis. Um, I how do I I kind of get the gist of how we get somebody into those cohorts of getting the 282 Bs? Um, and is it really just reaching out in that email and getting them on board? Because this is the part that we're struggling the most with is the 282 B. Um, the services we're okay picking those up at this point. Um, we have a new SPED director um, who's new to um, directing <laughs> special services. Um, she knows the world and has been a part of it, but not in that capacity. And so I feel like we're playing catch up in a couple of different roles that we hadn't anticipated. Um, but the 282B is my biggest concern um, right now and making sure. So just emailing, um, is it Tracy that we um, had on there um, earlier? And I apologize. Yes, Tracy Whitlaw. Um, I did take a picture of her email, and so I just want to make sure oh, that. Oh, good. I was just going to one too. Perfect. Okay, I can get in there too. Um, and I don't know. It might be helpful to have some input from um our certification team around that. Around, I don't know what they else they may have to offer. I mean, I appreciate Tracy's expertise on this particular subject and and her knowledge of what's available and able to support folks. But um, I mean, typically when I get asked a question like this, I'm sort of looking at like Leanne and other folks on my team to see if you get this too. I would turn to the certification team, but I'm curious. Well, I think in this case, reaching out to Tracy initially would be a really good first step in the process because I think just based on what you can share about the background of the educators who are in need of attaining the 282B will help her help you figure out what's the best pathway to pursue. Tracy's really, um, one of her responsibilities is kind of coordinating that work in the seed project and understanding these different pathways that people could follow. And so it at some point you are going to most likely need to reach out to certification to in order to um, attain that conditional certification. But I think Tracy would be a good first stop to helping you navigate that and knowing, OK, reach the certification, get this. Um, certification would certainly take a look at whatever the credentials or transcripts those individuals have and be able to determine what might be missing for them. Um, but Tracy will be able to tell you what are the pathways that you could pursue to try to fill those gaps. The, the, thank you. And the other question that I had, and I don't want to mon monopolize our time in the breakout room, but um, I, I'm sure others are experiencing the same thing where we've just now filled our special ed teacher positions, let alone the 282B that that's now required. And so one of the things that we would like to do is we have an amazing ed tech three that has her bachelor's degree and we've been encouraging her to go back and get that cert the certification. But now the 282B may be, you know, and great fit for her. And so is there that wiggle room to say that we'll be meeting the criteria of the 282B if we take that pathway as well? Yep. I, 
believe that one of the examples that Tracy shared this afternoon is specific to people who have their EdTech 3 certification that mm -hmm. gets them into that pathway. So they'll have to get um, into an approved program and document that they are part of that program, but that will get their foot in the door to get that, um, get them moving in that direction. Okay, and that will suffice for us making progress toward that certification. Obviously, um, you know, they're going to have to work with other people along the way and things like that. But I just, I don't want to be left all year right. without meeting a requirement. That's my only yeah. concern. Yeah, Marianne, I think that would be a really good question to pose to Tracy. I don't want to misspeak and say that that's all that they would need because okay. this is not my wheelhouse, but I think she'd be able to answer that specific question and whether or not they are working in a capacity where someone else is, you know, overseeing them. Maybe they're working under someone with a 282. Okay. Um, I just, that would be a better question for her, whether it's going to completely satisfy that requirement or not. Perfect. But no, I do I know there is a path for EdTech threes to get in um, and get going on attaining the 282B. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Cheryl, did you have a question? I throw your hand up. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, well, I guess more is more a comment. So I'm a special ed teacher and I have I've been an administrator for many years and I've kind of I'm administrator and special ed teacher in the position I'm in now. Um so I have the 282B conditional. Um, but I was required to take a few more classes, which I've taken two of the three that I needed to take. Um, plus, I'm in the main Roads to Quality Professional Development cohort. Plus, I'm in the SEEDS. Plus, um, I'm training for the Battelle and AC. It's become, it's it's like huge. It's a huge amount of time and commitment. And it's becoming kind of frustrating. And um, I just wanted just to voice that, that those are all the things that I've been doing since since August to get to where you need me to be. So, I mean, I think maybe it, it needs to be looked at, that that's really heavy, heavy for somebody that's also trying to learn um, to work with littler kids, right? Smaller kids on top of that. And I have 40 years teaching experience on top on, with all of this. So um, I just wanted to be, to voice that, that having all of those things come down at once is really a heavy load for special ed teachers. And this is definitely the forum for that, Cheryl. I'm glad that you voiced that. And anybody else that has concerns like that about the workload, please feel free. I'm taking notes down for Jen and Sandy about these kinds of things so that they can address them. Please keep keep sharing. And Cheryl, I don't want to dissuade you at all from being part of the um, Leading Early Learning Fellowship, but I do want to make sure that it's clear that that is not a requirement for this process. It's wonderful and it's a great opportunity and it, you know, we definitely encourage it, but it's not a requirement of attaining the 282B. So of all of the things that I'm doing for the 282B, that is the most useful to me. <laughs> it's the most useful well, because it's giving me it's giving me the developmental information that I taught right. middle school for a lot of years. I taught I taught 40 years. Right. So I've taught everything from you know little little in primary all the way up to eighth grade and I've taught high school algebra. You know, so I mean the oh, just having the review just, again of the of the little <laughs> has been great for me and that's probably the most useful piece of this <laughs> well the and, other piece, so i don't want to get that up cheryl and i are doing it together we're from the same school and it is wonderful to be reading the same things watching the same videos doing our observations um i would recommend that to anyone who's um moving into the early childhood program Thanks, Leanne. Thanks, Leanne. Yeah. That's, and on top of that, really it's getting us into the 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 pre K classroom and observing mm -hmm. a couple times a week, both of us, with a yeah. uh, a brand new teacher. So mm -hmm. in the both the K, K and the pre K. So I mean, I think it's one of the most useful things that we're doing this year. Well, I I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. <laughs>
really <laughs> heartwarming. And, and maybe there's a way to leverage that as, you know, that would be great feedback to offer the state board in chapter 115. Mm. Um, yeah, I do think too, that there is a period of time with the conditional certification that you have to get those courses completed. And I wanna say it's that, that you have at least two, if not three years to complete those before that runs out. Three, yeah. Yeah, so it may be, you know, I know we all want to try to accomplish everything all at once, but maybe spreading them out if you could a little bit um, is another strategy to consider to not so that you're not feeling like you're getting burned out. Well, if I, sorry, I originally, the letter originally got said that I had to take these to get my, my conditional. Two of the classes oh. conditional. Hmm. Yeah. Even though you had the 282 already. I wonder if that was miscommunicated. That sort of leads me back to my question of having a certification person mm -hmm. present, or at mm -hmm. least mm, uh, 340 in the afternoon, my brain is a little bit fried, but yeah. I can't think of the word okay. like on hand, right? Like <laughs> at the ready is what yeah. I was trying to get at. Nicole, it may be good to bring that topic up and you know, one of the, the weekly meetings to say, could we bring someone from certification? Would that make sense? I'm also thinking though that just a good practice, you know, I I try to keep in mind that certification is receiving hundreds of requests all of the time from educators and they're doing their best to try to go down through transcripts and um, currently held endorsements and match all of that up there are gonna be instances where they might look at something and not realize that's, you know, would have counted for this. So I think getting that first letter back from them, it's a good check on your part to say, okay, how does this seem to line up with what I think that I have accomplished? And then if you don't think that they have given you credit for something that you should have, or something does not seem to be matching, go back to them and say, hey, can we take a look at this again? Because it may be that something they just didn't realize. And, and sometimes they'll even come to us and say, hey, the educator has said that they've taken this particular course. Can you take a look at the course description and let us know, does that look like that fits what they need for this particular requirement? And then we can take a, a look at it with them and maybe give them a hand. Um, so it, you know, Take some time when you get those back <laughs> to give it some due diligence, but don't be afraid to look to back, reach back out to them and say, hey, I've got some questions. Can you give me a hand with this? So I apologize, a phone call came in and I've been on the phone. Where are we at in the meeting? Where, where do we? Yeah, good question, Leanne. So um, we broke into smaller breakout rooms from the larger group by like roles. So the folks that stayed in this room um, are, are those that have sort of oversight or uh, what have you of the programming that you're offering. Um, and then there's a group for superintendents, a group for finance data folks, and a group for special ed directors, which you're welcome to join one of those if you feel like that would be appropriate for you. Um, and, and really, we don't have any planned presentation to provide. We were just wanting to get folks in their like groups where they could have a common conversation and use common terminology and vocabulary with each other to, to help um, answer any questions or, you know, be thought partners on anything. Um, we were finding that in the larger group, some of the information we were providing was useful for some, but not all. So in an effort to try and address the needs of all team members that are working together in districts, um, this was just an idea that had popped up. So we were just chatting, as you know, about the certification piece, but I'm happy to open it up around, you know, bigger programming um, questions, successes, barriers, anything like that, needs for expansion, needs for funding. I don't know. I mean, we're not going to have all the answers, but Jackie is taking very good notes. So I trust that she'll jot it all down. Thank you, Jackie. So Appreciate I'm actually a superintendent. So I think I'll pop over and join them. Sure. Do you see how to do that? 
Got it. Okay. Thank so you. I did that and I didn't pop into that group. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and now it's gone. <laughs> um I'm I'm content staying here, but I I did hit superintendents and I just stayed here. So I just wanted did, to let you know what happened. Did you get on the list? Yeah. Did somebody get turned over to be the host, Jackie? Did Jen Hopkins happen to make you the host or Lori or I don't know. I don't see a host anywhere. There. I know. Because if, if somebody had was the host, they'd be able to actually move people into those rooms. Right. But I don't see that capacity. No. I do see next to the more now join breakout rooms with four yeah. little squares. I didn't see yeah. that earlier. Yeah, I pulled it up and I can see finance and data. There's five people, superintendents, there's four, special ed directors, there's 16. You just click join. Right, but yep. mine doesn't have that anymore. I clicked on the superintendent and then it went away. <laughs> so my more doesn't have the join oh. breakout anymore. So just letting you know, I'm I'm okay staying here, but there's a glitch <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> The um, join the breakout rooms is not inside the more button anymore. It's right it's next to it. Online. See if you can see it right next to the more button. It is there now. I am content. I don't know how much longer we have in these, but. Okay. Thanks, Marianne. I swear I'm not usually this technology challenge. <laughs> You're all good. I'm just curious beyond the set sort of setting like what the requirements are for the 282B. Are there any other professional development needs that you're finding are surfacing that would be useful to your educators? in the coming months. I know you've been doing a lot of, you know, trying to tick off all of the, the basic required pieces or getting training and specific assessments, but in the bigger picture on a day-to-day -day basis, are you noticing anything that you just wish, boy, it'd be great if we could do some professional learning in this area? I'll jump in and just say that I think breaking out in these sessions as to specific roles is going to be tremendously helpful um, because a lot of times the meetings went in so many different directions that I didn't feel like they were utilized for everybody appropriately. And yeah. so giving the time for people to be able to ask questions and not be in a group of 60 people will be much more helpful than the previous format. I'm looking for Jen Hopkins and I realize she's not in this room. Are you guys feeling pretty um, short up right now? Are you wanting to rejoin the large group or do you still have more that you wanted to talk about? I think we are technically the large group, the main room, but I don't know where Jen went also. Um, <laughs> and, and I think we probably are feeling pretty short up. I mean, we had some conversation to continue on of, of Tracy's presentation, but I'm happy to do whatever the larger group wants to do, Erin. Okay, I feel like I want to just end the chat rooms. <laughs> I feel like that might be really yeah, so. Yeah, I'm gonna. I, I'm. That's fine. Okay, I'm gonna pop into another room. I... I don't have any other questions 
or props. kind of feeling like everything must be going great in all of the classrooms and programs with the kids and the teachers and the parents and based on uh on kind of like no conversation right now but um would it be helpful to have like some topics of things that you you know might be having some challenges with for breakout rooms like this for the programming side of it like what what are we talking about when we talk about programming in general like some topic things topic lists gotcha. and cheryl has her hand up <laughs> sorry i don't mean to monopolize i do have a question um <laughs> we had a student that we were just contacted by cds who told us that they had been referred a student and they made a mistake and they had gone through the referral pro process to the evaluation process with the student and they're actually in our area. So they, they've they now handed them off to us and it it looks like, looks to be a speech, um, a speech uh, evaluation. So just my question is, and this is probably Leanne Condon's area, um, the child is not in our early childhood program, but is in our area. We would be providing speech to that child, speech services to that child. It, um, would we be reimbursed for that if they're not in our program? When you say they're not in your program, you mean they're they're not enrolled in your pre-K classroom? Yeah, no, I think, yes, Lori, right? What am yes. I looking at? Yes, yeah. you absolutely would be reimbursed. If they're three to five and they're in your catchment area, regardless of where they are physically, you'd be reimbursed. Okay. You can count them as a as one of your children. Oh, okay. Yeah, Good. so it's not just speech. You'd get the full allocation for that child. Cool, all right. Yes. Yep. Great, thank you. You're welcome. I was waiting to hear back from Erin, but looks like she's in another room. Cheryl, when you got the referral from them, how much of the evaluation was completed? And what else did you guys have to do to determine them eligible? We Well, the they had done the initial referral meeting and they had ordered evaluations. The evaluation form had not been signed yet or returned to CDS. 
So um, it, this all happened like early this week. Mm -hmm. um, so CDS was contacting the parent to tell them to drop the signed um, evaluation yeah. form off to us. So I'm contacting them tomorrow just to check in with them to make sure that that happens. So you, once you get consent, then you'll start with the evaluation yeah. process. Mm -hmm. We caught it early enough. <laughs> Great. And is this child transitioning? Had they been receiving early intervention services? Um, no. no, but they're in the Head Start program. Okay. In the next town over. So they were like a three-year-old or? Yeah, it's a three-year-old. Um, I don't know that the, I don't know that they even know that we have a program here. So at least when when we get the mom in here, we can at least talk to her about that too. Yeah. How do um, you notify <clears throat> the people who live in your community of the availability of preschool special education now that you're offering FAPE services? Um, we sent letters out to all the doctor's offices and have checked in with them for referrals. Um, and we have, we've advertised, we've put things out, we've word of mouth. We're a very small community. We've only got 27 kids in our school, total CADA or pre CADA, um, pre K to five. So we put posters out, um, Facebook, we've done everything that we can to get things out there to the community just so that they know we have a program. Wonderful. Great. You know, we, we need to start collecting the great ways that you're notifying so that we can kind of share with everybody else to say, like, here are some practices that have been effective in notifying our community of, yeah. of the availability of preschool special education services in our district now. Mm -hmm. I yeah, see Caitlin on the Jenna side. Hand up. Sorry. Yeah. No, I'll set. Go ahead, Katie. Um, I did have a question about our high cost kids. Do we know yet whether the higher cost kiddos will get additional funding? Yes. I should, as long as you're uh, putting in the documentation. Okay. Yep. And then my other question is, um, how many other area districts are servicing, like in a larger volume are servicing three-year-olds? Because we we currently are just like, you know, a few three-year-olds are getting some services. We're doing a little bit of that outreach with speech or OT for three-year-olds in our area that, as, a, as FAPE providers. But is anyone doing a three-year-old class at this point? I'd be curious to hear that as well, Kate. To my knowledge, I, as far as including three-year-olds that are um, typically developing and don't have an IEP, or do you mean just students with IEPs? Um, I think the goal would be to have like an inclusive classroom sure. in, the, you know, in the end. Um, yeah. You know, obviously, if we have a student with high, high needs, that's three that isn't getting any services, it's kind of case by case. But like the goal would be, to, you know, to can continue to add those services for our kiddos and have an inclusive classroom. We're not there yet. <laughs> I, just, I will just, tell you, there yeah. are several people that are operating three-year-old classrooms. RSU 35, I think, is operating one. And also, who's on this call somewhere. And, and then, uh, yep. And um, Scott is that person. And Scott had a great idea that I spoke to him about. But also, RSU 57 has a three-year-old program. It is... I thought your idea, Scott, about that was so great. Why don't you share it? Yeah. First of all, how do I say your first name? Is it Caitlin? Catalin? It's Caitlin. Okay. It's nice to meet you. I'm Scott. So I have two, I have three three year old sessions and a special purpose classroom that serves three and four year olds. Now, I do, I like what you said because you're like, well, that's where we eventually like to get to because that's where I'd like to get to too. So right now, what we do is we just bring the three year olds in for, for uh, the FAPE offering and we do their related service and give some, um, you know, some SDI just to get them into school and get them familiar with it. That's worked really well. What's lacking for me is the typical peers um, because in every program I've ever started in other places, I always tried to have a 50-50 ratio of students with disabilities and typical peers or else 
um, I don't know exactly how to say this. Um, if I have, <laughs> if I have too many special ed kids and not enough typical peers, then I've got a problem, right? Because they're learning from each other. I mean, that's how preschoolers learn. So it's really important for me um, that eventually I get to the point where we're talking about some typical peers too, because it will just be better for kids. But I will tell you, having a three-year-old classroom and busting those kids into the daycare and giving the experience of having a teacher and the speech pathologist and everything else and the principal has been a really good thing um, for kids. So, I mean, if you ever need any help or want to talk more, you can always email me. Um, you would talk, though, Scott, about potentially doing a lottery in your community for some yeah. I mean, there's different ways. To, there's different. There's different ways to do a fifty-fifty program. So let me tell the ways I've done them in other places is lottery, right? Okay. Now this one is not really a lottery, but you know the kid didn't qualify. The kid's homeless. Um, the kid still has issues. I have a tendency to sort of lean them into the typicals um, because they need something. So I think. Um, you know, you can do, there's a weighted lot. You could do that. You can do a weighted lottery system. You can do an open lottery system. It really depends on how you want to do it. And it, it, it will, it will create some issues when you do a lottery, just to let you know, um, because you're basically picking a handful of kids out of a greater population to come in and be your typical peers. So it doesn't feel great. Um, but until we have universal pre-K, that's what we, you know, that's what we're gonna do. And uh, so that's where I'm at with it is uh, how do we make it better? So. Another way that I've heard that done, Scott, is that um, if you have your pre-K screening events and yep. there are children who didn't qualify as children mm -hmm. with disabilities, having yep those kids be your typical peers because they could really benefit probably because there were concerns around their development. Yep, those kids. Yep. And that, yeah. Um, I've used that model too. It's the lean. Yeah. I mean, basically you're taking the kids that didn't qualify. You're taking the kids with other issues and you're, you're giving them something that they need, but don't qualify for. So actually that's been the most successful thing that I've done is um, include those other, those kids on the margins. So. Awesome. So you have a question? Uh, yeah, I think for us, our concern is we have like two kids and it's really not a classroom, you know, for three-year-olds. Um, and so they need that regular ed setting. And are they better off in like Head Start where there's more typical kids or do we create a three-year-old classroom because we don't have, you know, we have two kids don't need self-contained, don't need that special ed. They need that regular ed and, you know, for speech or whatever. And we decide that they need that. What do we do if we put them in our four-year-old program? They could be in there with a kid that turned five on October 15th and they're three, like three mm -hmm. in a day, you know? And that's a big disparity at that age because this is a typical, what's our 50-50 classroom? You know, so I think that's where we're struggling being a rural district. How do we like position these kids? Like where where should we shuffle these families? And is Head Start, which here has a wait list. So we can't say, oh, they could go to Head Start or, you know, or what do we pay a local program um, to provide or do we, do we create a program as well? So those, those are our big, Long term, you know, I think that's what Katie Katie was alluding to a little bit. Not not to speak to her, but those are the conversations we've been having. Do three year olds belong with the four year olds? And Nicole yeah. adds, even offering a play date a couple times a week for children to attend for a few hours can help hugely in accessing de typically developmental developmental peers and potentially identifying others in the community. So doing some kind of community offering couple times a week, very, very creative way. Thank you, Nicole, great idea. Also the build it and they will come idea. So if you have just a small number of kids initially, word gets out and then you start getting 
other kids who parents have concerns and um, other families who need childcare. So um, sometimes it's just do it and, and then it will grow. And I'm going to just pop in to just say, I would always consider making a referral to the Head Start program only because um, even if right now there's not a space, um, knowing the selection criteria and the fact that programs are expected to, to serve at least 10% of children who have identified needs can often, um, when a space does become available um, that through that selection criteria, um, they may be able to accommodate that need. So I would at least, you know, talk to the program and perhaps get them on the wait list. So um, they might be able to step in and provide those services. All right, I have got to run to another meeting. Um, thank you all so much for coming and we'll see you next week. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Not next week, week after. That's what I meant. November 6th, November 6th. <laughs> Bye.